you'll join me in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, this morning we are looking at verses 17 through 21 as we continue in our series through Paul's letter to the Romans. If you're following along in the blue ESV Bible, you can find that on page 948. The title of our sermon this morning is Overcoming Evil. And our key words for our worshipers and training are repay, evil, and vengeance. In J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, we are introduced to the one ring that was created by Sauron that enhanced the natural powers of the one who wore it. But unlike the other rings of power, the one ring was entirely evil. A person who bore the ring could more easily dominate and control others. The ring also allowed the one who wore it to see and to control the thoughts of anyone who wore any of the other rings of power. Part of the nature of the ring was that it was that it slowly and inevitably corrupted the one who wore it, regardless of any intentions to the contrary. Now, whether this was specifically designed into the ring's magic or was simply an artifact of its origins really isn't known, but part of its essential deceit was filling minds with the imagination of superior power. Its power to lust was so great that it was impossible for anyone on their own, even its own creator, Sauron, to try to destroy it. Now, with this ring, Tolkien gives us a picture of what it looks like when one attempts to defeat evil with evil. So, for the bearer of the ring, victory pursued or even achieved in the wrong way is utterly hollow. It would be a defeat because in becoming evil, to defeat evil, the ring wearer would have allowed evil to win. Now, as we continue in our series through Paul's letter to the Romans, we come to the end of chapter 12, and the Apostle Paul is showing us that to repay evil with evil is immediately to lose the battle of evil. The only way to defeat evil is by doing good to the one who has done harm. There are times when it may seem good, it may seem to be the right course to take on evil. We may convince ourselves that the ends justify the means, but when we have the notion that to do evil is a necessity, we unwittingly become a pawn to the evil force behind the evildoer, and in the end, everyone loses. This builds on the previous verses we looked at last time as we continue to think about how we as Christians are to function as we live our earthly lives in a broken and lost world. So let's read together Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, throughout the context of these final verses of chapter 12, good and evil are contrasted as we look at the Christian response to evildoers. Through chapter 12, we have seen that When we are moved by the mercies of God and when our minds have been renewed to grasp His will, all of our relationships are transformed. 
Not only do we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, we use our spiritual gifts for the good of God's kingdom. We love one another in Christian community. We bless those who persecute us. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We weep with those who weep. And now we see perhaps the most radical call of all, that we serve and love and seek to live peaceably with evildoers. The basic principle of these exhortations is summarized in verses 17 and 21. Paul writes, repay no one evil for evil, and do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, as we look at these verses, it's important to remember that with imperatives, as we've looked at before, as we've considered the law of God, that they are always stated in either a positive or a negative sense, but the other is always true as well. So, as we walk through this, we can pull even back in verse 14 because it follows along the same reasoning, and we can see in verse 14, it says that we are not to curse. That's the negative. But we are to bless. That is the positive. So, whether stated or implied, we always have the negative and the positive with imperatives. So, verses 17 and 18, we see that we should not retaliate, but to do what is right and to live peaceably with others. In verses 19 and 20, we see that we're not to take revenge, but to leave this to God, and instead we should serve our enemies. And then in verse 21, Paul tells us that we are not to be overcome by evil, but instead we must overcome evil with good. So, let's look at these three imperatives in verses 17 through 21. And the first one in verses 17 and 18, Paul tells us, do not retaliate against evildoers, but do what is right and seek to live peaceably with others. And so, when evil is perpetrated against us, all of us have a tendency to want to respond with the mentality that it is now payback time right? We even have a common phrase in our culture when we say, what goes around comes around. And from there, we are set on a course to find an opportunity to get even with the one who has offended us or wounded us. But, but we're going to see as we walk through this passage that Paul's great burden is to emphasize the reality of the human heart. And the reality is that we don't really just want to get even, do we? Really, when we get in that mindset, when we're in that frame of life, we don't just want to get even, we want to get one up. We want to win the battle of human relationships. And so, in the end, it's not us winning. It's not us getting the victory. It is the evil that wins. It is the evil that gets the victory. And nobody wins in that scenario because we respond to moral evil with moral evil, and that is not the way of the Christian. So, Paul very simply exhorts us, repay no evil with evil. Now, we generally think about something like this and probably think that it's about something being done to us physically, but this can include all kinds of scenarios. Perhaps in your workplace, you have determined that your company has done you wrong. Maybe you were truly wrongfully terminated from your employment, and you know it, and everyone else around you knows it. What are you going to do? Are you going to do everything in your power to try to take the company down? Go on social media, expose everything and everyone that you've worked with, and make it sound as bad as possible. You can go to the media to get your story out. You can try to hurt them financially. You can try to get them involved in a public relations nightmare. You can name names. You can expose salacious details and make sure everyone knows just how evil they are. It's become something of a norm in our social media culture today in the form of what has been called canceling, to create a cancel culture. And if there's a person that someone didn't like for some reason or another, they will go through everything they can find about that individual. Old messages on Facebook, old tweets on Twitter, old blog posts, interviews, podcasts, sermons, whatever it is, and they will find something that the general public will be upset by, often out of context, 
and they will disseminate it as far and as wide as they possibly can. And from there, they will call for sponsors to stop supporting that person. They will call on online platforms to stop sharing their content. They will frame that person to be as morally evil and corrupt as they can and to declare that they are a danger to society. They will do everything they can to cancel that person from our culture. And while we generally see this with people who have large followings or are public figures, it could happen to any of us. And in a culture that seems to be increasingly hostile to Christianity, there's no doubt that at some point, cancel culture may come for all of us. So how do we respond? Paul reminds us that the world is always watching us. When this happens to us, when we're being attacked, when an evildoer comes against us, what will the world see in our response? Can they see something different in us? Even when we are slandered, even when lies are told about us, even when our friends pull away perhaps because they want to appear relevant or they don't want to be associated with us so that they can avoid the mob themselves, how are we going to respond? Does the world see tender hearts? Do we show them that we can, in fact, be trusted? Do they see that we are not out to destroy whoever it is that comes for us? Or do they see us respond to evil with evil? The unbelieving world can be very hostile toward Christians, but they're not dumb. They can see whether or not the virtues we espouse as Christians are present in our lives and in our responses. And so Paul tells us, give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. I love how Paul writes that. He says, give thought to this. In other words, don't just respond. Don't just do the first thing that comes to mind. Don't just jump into action. Give thought to it. And there is no doubt that this is tied to what we read earlier in the chapter about renewing our minds, right? We need renewed minds so that we can give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. We need wisdom to respond in the way that pleases God and not our flesh. We need wisdom to not respond to evil with evil, but to put our Christian virtue and moral uprightness on display before the world because we have been transformed by Christ. And so, the next exhortation follows, and I love how practical Paul is here. He says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now, Paul realizes this is not always possible, but so far as it depends on you, do whatever you can, however you can, to live peaceably with all. Now, the sad reality is that I know far too many Christians who have broken relationships that shouldn't be broken. I have had broken relationships in my own life, and I can, I can look back and think of ways that I could have done better to respond with patience and grace as opposed to a desire to get my own way and to achieve an, an outcome that looked more peaceable than vengeful. But we need to remember that promise of Jesus in Matthew 5, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Are you a peacemaker? Are you always at odds with someone else? Is there always conflict in your life and your relationships? How do you respond to the moral evils that you see or that may be perpetrated against you? Do you respond in the flesh or do you rely on the Spirit of God to guide you in wisdom to a godly conclusion where you do all that you are able to do to reach peace? It's not easy by any means, but it is the way of a Christian who is walking with Christ. It is the way of Christ that we saw in His own earthly ministry. If you, if you are, as a Christian, if you have a long list of people in your life who you consider to be your adversary, there's a good chance it's not because you're so godly and you are so focused on walking by the Spirit that they're just so offended at you that they're going to lash out and stand against you at all costs. 
There may be a few people like that in our lives, but if you, if you look at the situation and conclude that it's even possible that you have a part to play in the hostility, you've got work to do. I even hear pastors sometimes bragging about how many people dislike them or even how other Christians and churches stand against them in some way. That's not something to brag about. More than likely, it's time to reassess our interactions and see if we can truly conclude that we've gone out of our way to be peacemakers. It's possible. It's possible to live our lives among unbelievers and to continue to walk in godliness and holiness and yet for them to not be our adversaries. In fact, this is something of a qualification for a man to be an elder. He is to be well thought of among outsiders. There are certainly very open and hostile enemies to the church, but living at enmity with them should not be the norm. Now, without being thoughtful, some might conclude that this just means that Paul is telling us we should all just be doormats. We just lay down, let everyone walk all over us and just say, no problem. I mean, I wish you wouldn't do that, but go ahead and do what you're going to do. I'm just going to lay here. We're also not called to just sit back and let people attack us no matter what. We have a biblical and godly right and responsibility to defend ourselves and others, to protect life when there's imminent danger. You'd be a fool to think that Jesus or Paul were doormats. That's certainly not the case. The emphasis here is that we're not a people who love a fight. We're not a people who are always looking for a quarrel. We're not a people who jump at every opportunity to respond to blows we receive with retaliation. This can be tricky because it's also possible for us to have a false peace. It's possible to just pretend like there's peace when in fact we're holding a grudge. Maybe we're bitter. Maybe we're avoiding the other person altogether. When people have wronged us, it's easy. It's very common. It's very simple to avoid them, and we can convince ourselves that it's okay. I'm not paying them back. I just don't want anything to do with them. Reminds me of Fiddler on the Roof. They came to the czar and uh, they came to the rabbi and said, "Rabbi, is there a prayer for the czar?" And he said, "Yes. May God bless the czar and keep him far away from us." But you see, our avoidance is just another form of payback, not overcoming evil. Martin Luther commented that this is a fleshly peace based on a falsehood rather than truth. It's a false peace that is born out of cowardice rather than courage. You see, if you've been sinned against, if you've been wronged, if you've been reasonably offended, you should confront it and seek reconciliation at all costs. But there will be times when the other party is not willing to live at peace with us, or they put forward terms of reconciliation that involve an immoral compromise, so the terms for peace are unacceptable. So we continue to pray for them, we continue to do good to them, we continue to keep the conditions open for peace. But we have to remember too, brothers and sisters, that we live in a culture that now finds everything offensive. Some people are looking for reasons to be offended. It's like they can't go through the day. They can't breathe the air without being offended. And when we say or do something that they simply do not like, but it's not sinful or wrong, they may still be offended. But we're not called by God to make peace by simply not saying or doing something because others don't like it. That's not Paul's point. Again, we're not doormats. There are plenty of things that we will say and do as Christians that the world will not like, but so be it. Nevertheless, it's not a godly approach to intentionally add fuel to a fire in most instances. Seek to be a peacemaker whenever possible. 
Next, Paul goes on in verses 19 and 20 to exhort us, do not take revenge, but lovingly serve your enemies. Read those verses with me again. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, if Paul didn't grate against our flesh in the previous verses already, he certainly does here. He just continues to pile on the exhortations, and here he's showing us how we are to show mercy toward those who oppose us, and this is the very means that God utilizes to exact justice. Have you been mistreated? What does Paul say? Don't take justice into your own hands. Do not take vengeance. Why? Because the wrath of God will be revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. There is vengeance. There is justice. All things will be set right. Paul here is quoting Deuteronomy 32 and verse 35, vengeance is mine. God has the sole prerogative for vengeance in the universe. He is the sole rightful judge, jailer, and executioner. And if anyone else has this responsibility, it will be because God and only because God has given it to them. And that's where Paul goes at the beginning of Romans 13, showing that there are civil authorities to whom he has given this responsibility. In other words, God is saying, vengeance is mine, and I share it in various ways and measures with certain institutions that I have ordained. And I will note, and Paul is making clear here, that institution is not you as an individual. But this is a profound reality, isn't it? It means that God's justice is woven into the fabric of the universe, and it flows out of God's nature and God's being. Remember, as we read all of this, we we cannot forget that God does not overlook sin whatsoever. There is not one sin that has ever been or ever will be committed in the world that will not be punished. And if you're here this morning and you've not placed your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I hope you will hear what I'm saying to you right now. You are responsible for all of your sin. Every careless word, every sinful deed, every evil thought, every wicked intention of your heart, and God has decreed that the penalty for your sin will be paid. You will stand before God to be judged on your own merit, and you will be found wanting because His standard is absolute perfection according to His law, and everyone readily admits that they are not perfect. To date, I still haven't met one who has said otherwise. So what hope do you have on your own? You have no hope because you are not righteous, because you have sinned against your Creator, and so you will pay the penalty for your sin for all eternity. But God has made a way, a way of salvation for you to come to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, trusting Him and resting in Him and relying on Him, believing in His perfect law-fulfilling life, trusting in His death on the cross, rejoicing in His resurrection from from the dead, that all that Christ has done is sufficient for you to stand upon before the Father. Christ's perfect righteousness is absolutely necessary if anyone is to ever escape the wrath of God. And on the cross, Jesus received the penalty that was reserved for the sin of His people. In other words, when you turn to Christ by faith, it means that your cosmic crimes are punished in our suffering substitute, and He invites you to come He calls you to trust. He exhorts you to believe. And when you come to Him in humility, trusting in your heart and confessing with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, He will save you. 
Right? You might look at your sin and think it's too much. There's just no way God will ever forgive me. But the beauty of Christ's sacrifice is that it is sufficient for even the most heinous of sins, the greatest offense, the most vile ungodliness and blasphemy. And if you come to Him, He will not turn you away. He will not reject you, but He will receive you as His child in love. Will you trust Christ, the one who gave His life as a ransom for many? The Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all, and so we can trust that whoever we are or whatever we've done, He is enough. His sacrifice is enough. Now, brothers and sisters, we have to remember that when we want vengeance, one of our motivations for not returning evil for evil, but rather blessing and serving our adversaries is the certainty that all sin will be punished by God, even if that individual doesn't turn to Christ by faith. Now, this doesn't mean that we should sit back with a smirk on our face, gleeful that they will one day be punished under the wrath of God. We should not have a subtle hatred and a gladness that they will go to hell. God forbid. Proverbs 24 says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and is displeased and turn away his anger from him. Now, all of us have been wronged at some point, but how do we respond? Someone has likely even wronged us who never sought to be reconciled or never admitted their wrong, and one of the great hindrances to you being able to let go of your bitterness is that there has been an injustice that has gone without response, and we have an innate sense that without justice, the world will just unravel, and anyone and everyone can just get away with doing any kind of horrible evil that they want. Justice simply won't be done. So we hold on to anger. We play the story over and over and over again with our feelings. It shouldn't have happened. It was wrong. But see, what Paul is doing here is he's seeking to relieve that burden from us, to lay down our anger, to lay down our efforts, to nurse our hurt and keep the fire burning. When you lay down your burden of vengeance, God will pick it up. This is not a subtle way of getting revenge. This is a way of giving vengeance to the one to whom it belongs. It is taking a deep breath, perhaps for the first time in decades, and feeling like now at last you are free to love. Again, no sin will go unpunished. No one, and it may be difficult, but it is essential that we would even pray and delight in the possibility that no one will go through life without their sins being punished, that even our worst adversary. will have to have their sins dealt with. But what Paul is calling us to is that our desire, our longing would be not that they stand before God on their own to be judged in themselves, but rather that we could see them in heaven by their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, of course, our flesh rebels against this notion. But isn't that what we should ultimately want as Christians? Perhaps the reason they've come against you is because they are an enemy of God, but the Christian's desire is for reconciliation, not just between us and others, but between man and God. The truth is, someone may do something unbelievably heinous against you, but the supernatural work of God in our lives is working to lead to a conclusion that their greatest need is not to suffer our wrath, but rather to escape the wrath of God by fleeing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you ever pray that for an enemy? We're called to speak and act courteously and kindly toward those who are hostile, not as a means of rubbing their nose in it, but thoughtfully finding ways to wish them well and doing what is helpful and speaking to them in a respectful manner. 
In church history, there have been many amazing examples of this kind of living, even in recent decades. There's a story from January of 1999. A man named Graham Staines was an Australian missionary who had spent 34 years serving the people of India in the name of Christ. He was a director of a mission there in India, and he and his two sons, a 10-year-old named Philip and a 6-year-old named Timothy, they were mobbed by radical Hindus. They were trapped inside their vehicle in Orissa, India, and they were burned alive. Now, the three charred bodies were recovered, clinging to each other. Now, his widow Gladys and their daughter Esther were still living. They were not with the guys that day. And Gladys' response to this terribly sad and devastating news was printed in every newspaper throughout India to the glory of Christ. She said, just a few days after their martyrdom, I have only one message for the people of India. I'm not bitter, neither am I angry but I have one great desire, that each citizen of this country should establish a personal relationship with Jesus Christ who gave His life for their sins. Let us burn hatred and spread the flame of Christ's love. Now, after they were killed, everyone thought Gladys and Esther were going to move back to Australia, but she said, God called us to India, and so she wasn't leaving. She said, my husband and our children have sacrificed their lives for this nation. India is my home. I hope to be here and continue to serve the needy. And then perhaps most remarkably at all, and I hope all of our teenagers will listen to this, their daughter Esther was asked how she felt about the murder of her father. And the then 13-year-old said, I praise the Lord that He found my Father worthy to die for Him. It's a supernatural response, isn't it? And oh, how we should pray that God would give us such a response, that God could make us to be these kinds of people, that we could have young people like Esther that can see that the greatest goal in life is not to live but whether by life or death, that Christ be honored in our bodies. Now, notice the mercy that Paul presents in verse 20. Not only are we to not take vengeance into our own hands, but we are to serve our enemies. There's often a misunderstanding of what Paul writes when he, uh, what, what he means when he writes, for by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. There's a lot of different translations of this. In the Old Testament, it is said that God will rain fiery coals on the wicked. So some conclude that Paul is saying that serving our enemies will, will only work to increase the punishment that they will eventually receive. But I think the context of the passage runs contrary to that conclusion. It seems odd that Paul would exhort us to love our enemies and then give us guidance to ensure that the punishment is in some way more severe. I think the more probable explanation seems to be brought from the art of metalwork. Fire is used in metalwork to convert ore to a metallic state. The fire is heaped on the ore, it's cast in the furnace, and the ore is melted and it becomes malleable so it can be used for whatever the metal worker decides to do with it. So it seems that Paul may be pushing us to persevere, to do good, and in so doing, perhaps our actions and our words will produce gratitude even in a very depraved heart. It may in fact mean that many coals heaped upon ore, many attempts to do good might need to be pursued so that in time, perhaps there will be a melting of the heart of the one who has injured us unjustly. In time, perhaps, love will take the place of suspicion, love will take the place of hatred toward us, and perhaps God will use our efforts to be a means for that individual's salvation. True love toward an enemy produces a disposition to do good, which manifests itself in supplying wants, relieving, distress, seeking in every way to promote the satisfaction and welfare of the person who has acted unjustly toward us. 
If a man who has done me wrong is found in poverty and affliction, I must not find enjoyment from his sufferings, but instead I must give of myself to provide for his relief. If he is hungry, I am called to feed him. If he is thirsty, I am called to give him a drink. If he is naked, I am called to provide him with clothes. If he is in pain and does not have a means to alleviate that pain, I should do what I can to supply him and do all that I can to prolong the life even of the man who had intentions to shorten mine. If we see a man who has acted dishonestly toward us, and he is about to be cheated in business, instead of sitting still with secret satisfaction in our minds that we get to see him ruined, we should give of ourselves to see that we save him from the trap that has been set to entangle him. If we hear the man who has been slandering us, that false things are being said about Him, and charges are being brought against Him, which we know are untrue. We must not sit silently and allow the poisoned arrow to hit the mark for which it is purposed. Rather, we must stand up and defend His reputation, even when He has trampled ours, and do justice to His character, who did all in His power to unjustly destroy our reputation. In other words, God calls us to seek every opportunity to do good to those who have sought to injure us, and in so doing, perhaps, perhaps the Lord may be pleased to melt the heart of stone and mold it back to a heart of flesh that loves God and neighbor. And so Paul concludes in verse 21 and tells us, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word overcome is a military word. It means to overpower. It's extremely penetrating and radical. Paul says that to repay evil with evil is immediately to lose the battle with evil. To put on the one ring is to be overtaken by evil. And when evil defeats evil, all that occurs is evil. And so Paul shows us the only way to defeat evil is by doing good to the one who has done us harm. In other words, if you hate a person who has wronged you, that person has won. The only way to defeat the evil is to overcome that evil with good. It's important that we we not too closely associate evil with the evildoer. Because it is a good and godly desire that we want the destruction of evil. But we should not desire the complete destruction of the evildoer, lest we find ourselves doing evil in response, justifying it because of what they have done. Now, no doubt, this is almost certainly the loftiest response in human behavior that could be put before us. Don't let your enemy's hostility produce hostility in you, but let your love triumph over his hostility. Don't be overcome by evil means. Don't be overcome by his evil. Don't let another person's evil make you evil. And so all said and done throughout chapter 12, Paul is saying this from the beginning to the end. Have you been wronged by someone who is hostile to you? How will you respond? In vengeful cursing, paying them back whenever and however you can, or in undeserved love and blessing, doing what you can for them in whatever way is best for them. Notice there's no persecution so great that Paul makes an exception to this rule. No hurt so deep that Paul excuses us from living the way that he has outlined but how can everyone, anyone ever really live this way toward their friends, let alone their enemies? Well, Paul has already told us we can do it only if we really do live, as he showed us in verse 1, by the mercies of God. The gospel alone makes each aspect of love possible. The gospel reminds us of how patient God is and was with us. 
He was patient with us before we came to faith, holding back His final judgment to lead us to repentance. But He's also patient with us now, having forgiven our ongoing flaws and failings in Christ. The gospel is also, Paul showed us in verse 3, the way we think of ourselves with sober judgment. We are to measure ourselves by the faith in Christ that God has given to us. And when we think of ourselves in the gospel, two things will happen. One is that we, we realize that we were lost sinners, as lost as anyone else on the face of the earth, and, and so whoever stands before us, whether the person is a Christian or not, whether they are a decent person or not, that they are no lower in sin than we were as well. And so we know that though we are sinners, we are wholly justified and loved by God Himself. So in the end, we have nothing to prove to anybody. Nothing. Without the gospel, we need to convince ourselves and we need to convince others of our value and worth by associating ourselves with those that we think to be most admirable. But in the gospel, we find that the most admirable person of all was already pleased to be our Savior and to dwell within us. So we're freed to love the outsider and the difficult and the awkward. And some of you are mighty awkward. We're able to honor all. We're able to come alongside those who are marginalized and those who seek to do us harm. So Christian love is the most unbiased thing possible. Both our knowledge of our sin and our knowledge of our acceptance destroys prejudice and pride. The gospel enables us sincerely and lovingly to share in others' highs and lows. On the one hand, only if Christ is our main joy will we be able to rejoice and mourn with others. For example, perhaps you're single and you want to be married. How can you rejoice with your friend who is now engaged? It will be hard in any case, but if marriage is an idol, if your marriageability is your righteousness, then it will be impossible for you to rejoice with them. On the other hand, unless Christ is your righteousness and peace, it will be difficult to enter into the grief of others. One reason why you may not be able to mourn is that you may have trouble sympathizing with a person you despise or a person you feel superior to. But the gospel tells us that you are in no way superior to anyone. It brings you down to make a right appraisal of yourself. And the gospel tells you that God loved you when? When you were His enemy. When you were at enmity with Him. And when you grasp that, you find yourself loving those you would have otherwise despised. On the other hand, the gospel enables us to do loving deeds, even when we don't feel loving because the gospel tells us that there is a judge and He can be trusted to make all things right. We do not need to get even. There is one who cares for us and for His world and who will make sure that every sin is dealt with and that justice is scrupulously administered. We are free to leave room for God's wrath because we know He will repay. The cross shows how seriously God takes sin and that He will punish it. Peter puts this very powerfully when he tells Christians who are suffering for doing good as they follow in the footsteps of Christ. He says, when they hurled their insults at Him, He did not retaliate. When He suffered, He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. The gospel promises us justice and reminds us that we are not the ones who give it. Now, of course, living like this is not easy. Paul showed us in verse 1, to do so is a living sacrifice, so it is completely countercultural in every way. In our day, there is a great emphasis in the therapy, psychology, culture on being true to yourself, being good to yourself. Why? 
Well, many counselors see people who are so needy for love out of this deep conviction that they are unlovely, that they allow others to walk all over them and abuse them. And so as a result, the wisdom of our age is to say, find out what you want and go for it. Stay in a relationship only if it's mutually beneficial. And if you have to make a lot of sacrifices, that's not healthy. Have a better esteem of your own value, of your own worth. You don't need them. Get out. But you see, the problem with this is that it's an oversimplification. The world does not understand the gospel nor the many forms of sin and self-righteousness. And so it cannot tell the difference between someone who is trying to serve others as a means of finding justification and salvation from someone who is trying to serve others as a response to having been justified. But we are to love others at a cost to ourselves. Not to earn someone's love, not to earn God's love, but in view of the love that has already been lavished upon us. The Bible makes much of Jesus' sacrificial love for us, and there is no thing that anyone could possibly do against us that is worse than anything that we in our sin have done against our God. And so He was stripped and He was killed in order to love us. And so in view of that, we are to live as He did and to love as He did. And if the way we love one another comes at a cost to ourselves, we have started to know what Christ-like love truly is and then we have truly learned what it means to overcome evil. Amen.